um, people having different. Here we go. Now we're going to start the recording. So from starting from here, I have to be perfect. Um, people having different expectations, transformation plans that don't include change management and decision making. Great. So transformational leadership is hard. And one of the reasons it's hard is because it's a change in form, not just a change in what we're doing. And I hear, and that is part of the misconception. People say, well, transformational changes, we used to do this and now we're gonna do this. Well, it's not just about what you're gonna do. Sometimes it's about how we think and how, what our lenses are and what our perspectives are, our thinking, our thinking frames. And that, those things are deeply embedded and harder to change than just changing an action or an activity or a process. So we're turning into a butterfly. So I'm using these living systems metaphor for you there, Frederick. So transformational leaders, so as a transformational leader, our job is to breathe life into organization. That's, that's what we're doing. We're creating that vibrancy. We're changing the form. We're breathing new life. So I use that, again, that living system metaphor for transformational change. So those of you, and I think anyone in an agile role is probably in some kind of a transformational leadership role. Um, do you identify with any of these terms listed here? Change agent, disruptor, truth teller, pioneer. Go ahead and put in the chat if there's any other, if any of these terms resonate for you, or if there's another term about how you think of yourself besides job title. But if you think of yourself as like what your actual role is. I think there's some that include swear words that I didn't put on here. Influencer, that's not a swear word, but I love it. <laughs> I hear, oh, well, we're recording, so I won't say any swear words, but there are some for this. Change agent, okay, a lot of people say that. Way forger, pathfinder, truth teller, people engineer, I love it. Truth, okay, so a lot of you consider yourself truth tellers. Teller. So that's perfect because we're gonna talk about how to do that and disruptor, bridge builder. builder. So how do we do that in a way that is not destructive and more constructive or generative. Now, the other thing about being a transformational leader is that we're part, I say part spiritual leader, part work manager, part inspire, part community builder. And I say spiritual leader, no, not, not from a religious perspective, but about that soulful side, we're building the culture, we're helping people get past some of their like embedded baggage. And sometimes that requires a bit of a spiritual leadership and that's inspiring too. But yeah, and then we still have to manage the work. So there's that practical side and the soulful side again coming together. So what I'd like to do with you today is talk through the three lenses of transformational leadership. And my book is divided into these same three sections, but I'm gonna give you a little sampler platter of each of these lenses today. So a little bit about the me, a little bit about the we, and a little bit about the system. But the book has lots more. Um, so Kat, my helpful, colleague Kat has created a, an organizer for today's content, which Kat, if you could put in the chat, then you can take a quick download of that. And that'll also ask you for your email, which will keep you connected with me as I'll talk about later. What we have coming down the pike is some online training and some community for people who want to stay connected with other folks in this role. So transformational leadership community, because like we said, this is hard, there's no template, and sometimes there's nobody else around you in your company doing it. So we want to try and kind of collect ourselves and we'll be launching a community very soon, but stay tuned for that. But for now, just download the organizer. Kat, can you throw that in the chat? I'm going to keep moving. Okay, here we go. Okay, Kat did that. Thank you, Kat. Okay, so let's talk about the me, mastering your domain. Seinfeld fans out there will get the reference, but if you're not a Seinfeld fan, you're still, you could take it literally and that still works. So the me is where we start because this is one of the ways, self-mastery is one of the ways to prevent burnout and avoid sabotaging yourself. So you don't sabotage yourself on purpose, but you may sabotage yourself unknowingly because you're not quite in full self-awareness. So let's talk about that. <clears throat> You are the instrument of your craft. And I love this quote, as a transformational leader, any kind of leader, even an agile coach, you probably know this. You are the instrument of your craft. You have an impact on everything you touch. So we wanna keep that front and center and be tuning our instrument at all times and making sure that that instrument is working the way it should. Not necessarily dancing in the water like the picture, but doing our jobs the best way we can. So two of the core competencies that go with the me, our self-awareness, which is really the root of all of the me, and then armor removal. So 
So let's talk about those. So self-awareness. There was a study recently, um, and it was in uh, Harvard Business Review, that 95% of people believe they're self-aware, but the real number is 12 to 15%. Now, I don't know that you can say self-aware or not self-aware. I think it's always some kind of a continuum, but that's a lot of us that think we're self-aware, but we aren't. So that makes it challenging to become self-aware because we think we already are, so why bother? So I think we need to just commit to always seeking. And the paradox is the more self-aware you become, the more you realize you lack, right? So every time I know for myself, every time I get a little bit of self-awareness, it's like, oh, what else was I missing? <laughs> what else did I not know? You can think about self-awareness on two, on two axes. There is the internal, how well do I know myself? And then there's the external of how, how do other people see me? So check out this, what did we say ouch about, Shelly? <laughs> the, oh, the, the amount of people? Yeah. The stat, yeah, right? But I don't know that you can say you're self-aware or not. I'm not sure it's binary like that. So see where you put yourself on these quadrants. So if you are low, if you have low internal self-awareness and low external, you're kind of a seeker. You're trying to figure yourself out. You're trying to figure out the world. Maybe part of our youth was like that. If you're high internal, very introspective, but very low external, you're really an introspector. You're always looking for self-awareness internally, but you're not really sure that you're clear on how you're perceived. Now, I thought this was interesting. If you're high external and low internal, so I'm not clear on what my values are. I'm not sure what I like, how, what my drivers are inside, but I really am attuned to how other people perceive me. I could end up being a people pleaser where I'm constantly changing how I think and changing my values based on other people's responses. Where, of course, we want to be is self-aware, high in both. So you can throw in the chat any um, where you might see yourself if you want to share or if maybe there's another dimension that we should be thinking about. But I thought this was helpful to see because we really need to build on both dimensions. So how do we get it then? If most people think that they have it and they don't have it. Okay, great, Frederick. We're, I think agile coaches are introspectors, right? So how can you measure self-awareness? Glenn, I see your question. So let's talk about that. So first of all, how do I gain it? And then we'll talk about how to measure it. Um, the, the way to gain it, I think, really starts with just a commitment to say, it's a journey. It's not, a, I have it or I don't have it, as much as Harvard Business Review would like us to think that. Um, just seeking it, just asking for it, and paying really close attention to other people's reaction to you. And looking for those external signals and seeing how they align with my internal compass, right? So why am I reacting to something that somebody said and some introspective, some introspection about your external stimulators are helpful. Now, Glenn, in my book, I do list a few different ways to measure it. There's a bunch of tests online. The trick is if you don't have it, no quiz is going to help you. So really the key there is there are quizzes online and also the Johari window is another one where you, you quiz yourself and then you send that same quiz to some people that may be close to you. So, and you look at what's the gap between how I see myself and how they see myself, and you get these, you get some descriptors of ways that other people see you that you don't see yourself. So that's really helpful. Uh, Frederick, I see your question about emotional intelligence. So yes, whole chapter on emotional intelligence that we won't be able to cover today, but when you, understanding your emotional intelligence and in your emotional literacy as well is super important because one of the things that I like to talk about is emotional intelligence is feeling your emotions without being driven by them, right? So getting them, there's tons of data in emotion. We don't want to suppress them. I think old school leadership would say, suppress your emotions, don't show emotions. Let's feel them and then decide what to do with them. That's, the, that's what I consider to be emotionally intelligent. Okay. Let's move on to the second piece of the me, because it's the sampler platter today. So we're going to just kind of touch lightly on some of these things, but they're pretty deep topics. Um, so you may have heard Brene Brown's famous quote from Dare to Lead that is the biggest barrier to courageous leadership is not fear, it's armor. And when I first heard that, I think a lot of people, when they first heard that, it was shaken up because we thought it was supposed to be like great leaders have no fear. It's not that they don't have fear. All leaders, a lot of successful leaders will tell you, I'm, I have fear and I sort of do it anyway, but the armor is really more of the barrier. 
because as a leader, followers are important, right? So how do we connect with followers if we have armor? It kind of puts a blocker there. Oh, I see, Karen, your question about the HBR article. Um, I can post a link to that. It's it, it's a great article, and they do have a self-awareness quiz in the article. It's um, actually, Teresa, I know you're on. If you have that link, because you sent it to me, maybe you can throw that in the chat. Um, it's not, the article is great. She just does say that that statistic about people who are self-aware and people who aren't, and I just don't think it's quite that binary. I don't think it's that you're self-aware or not. I think we're all somewhere on the journey. Okay, so what is armor in the first place? Back to armor here. So armor is emotional protection to shield us, to shield ourselves from shame and pain. If you're familiar with Brene Brown, you know she loves shame or she loves to talk about shame anyway. Um, and it helped us. We built, we create that armor because it helped us at some point, but it may not be serving you anymore. Some of that armor that you've built that's blocking out some of that shame and pain is now blocking out good things and blocking out human connection and things that you need to be a transformational leader. The trap, and here's the part, the trap about armor, besides the fact that it can block out the good, it can put an obstacle between the good stuff, is that it shows up as some things that we might value. So perfectionism that may have gotten you lots of rewards in your job, right? So perfectionism can be an armor. It's gotten you rewards, so you wouldn't let it go, but it's also blocking you. So think about someone that you know is perfect, that you know who's perfect. Are they hard to connect with sometimes when they're being perfect? Maybe because they're so perfect, like why would I even have a collaboration with them? They know everything, knowledge. So knowledge is my personal armor, I'll share with you. And I thought if I could just know everything, no one could ever poke any holes in me. No one ever could ever say I'm wrong. No one could ever dispute me. And that's great. I, I really do know a lot of things, but it doesn't invite people in to have a conversation with me or collaborate with me. Um, jokes, of course, are one of the uh, pieces of armor. Also fun, right? People can think you're funny and that's very rewarding. Avoidance, people pleasing, ego, all of these things and more can show up as your armor. So let's do a little bit of introspection here and maybe throw in the chat, um, what's your go-to armor? What's your favorite armor? And maybe it's something good, maybe it's something that is not that you're not rewarded for, but we all have some. So go ahead and throw that in the chat, see if anything comes up here, if you're willing to share. Avoidance, people pleasing. Yeah, you can be really rewarded for people pleasing, right? Oh, a lot of people pleasing. See, I'm from New York. We don't really do that people pleasing thing over here. <laughs> um, but we can be, we can lean into knowledge for sure. Um, not sharing, not, so lack of vulnerability. Yep, okay. Let's see. Uh, from New York to Frederick. Okay, so you don't have the people pleasing then. Analytical, see. Um, Situational, right? You can have different armor at different times, Mary. Yep. Saying yes to all the things. Jokes. Yeah, it can show up all different ways. Shutting down. So that's another one, stonewalling and shutting down. People pleasing. Um, and then they can also be, yeah, Chris, uh, imposter syndrome is definitely part of a lot of the armor because we're trying to be, again, so now we're trying to be something that we're not or, or we're just trying to protect ourselves right, from that internal self-awareness. People shutting down, yeah. And then, of course, that repeated pattern, like this this is that, this is the, this is that game of, well, I experienced something like this before, so this is what it is now. So I'm gonna, that's a similar pattern. And I'll tell you, I was, I worked out this morning and I won't go to this one class with a woman who reminds me of someone I waitressed with 40 years ago, because that must be her, right? <laughs> this is that. Okay, so let's see. So we got some armor and peeling that back then and peeling it off, it can be hard at first. I remember a day when I started peeling back my armor and then I just didn't have, you know, you can get hurt more. Like you feel more hurt because that shame and pain is now exposed. But on the flip side, you have a lot more availability and openness to connect with all of these folks that you need to be influencing, as you said in the chat, as a transformational leader. So, I promised to talk about burnout and I, we haven't talked about that yet. So how does self-awareness and armor prevent burnout or help with burnout? Well, all of these things, when we're lacking self-awareness, 
when we're maintaining our armor, that all takes our energy, right? That armor is exhausting to carry around and maintain. So peeling back that armor, as much as it might expose you to some more pain, it really does help with the burnout because that maintenance and the more we layer it on, it's heavy. And we leak, and when we're not self-aware, we're leaking out energy, right? Because we're not connecting, we're not aware of our impact, we're not getting the results we think, people aren't perceiving us the way we think they are. Um, we're not aligned, our external is not aligned with our internal, and it causes this energy leakage. Oh, I have a picture of energy leakage, there we go. Um, your cell phone is depleting, because you have all of these things that you're managing without really realizing you're managing them, but tons of energy is going into it. And then the world around us is leaking energy too, because, well, let me put that back for a second. The world around us um, is leaking energy because they're trying to accommodate our lack of self-awareness and our armor. And I don't know if you've ever had a team that you've noticed. So I had a team that I noticed was doing things to accommodate my idiosyncrasies. What a waste of time, right? They're like, well, we wanna do this the way that you'll like it. No, my gosh, okay, I'm sorry that I made you feel like you needed to do that. But no, please don't spend time accommodating my idiosyncrasies. So go ahead, where have you seen your energy leaking because of some of this me, the stuff in the me, the self-awareness and the armor? I see there's lots of stuff in the chat here that I missed, so let's see. Um, yeah, so organizations aren't necessarily so open to vulnerability yet, right? We have to peel that back. We're getting there. Um, and oversharing too, as a form of um, as a form of vulnerability. So again, feel the emotion and then decide what to do with it. Oh, okay, Teresa. I see. Um, I'll I'll try and grab the HBR article at the end and put it if you don't have it handy. Okay, taking on too much responsibility. Right, That's a that, that can lead to burnout. Oh, okay, thanks Teresa for the article link. Not being truthful and authentic. Right, and, that, and that's all, not being truthful and authentic, that can really lead to burnout because that's just hard on the soul, right? And the, the soul is what's burning out, not the doing. It's not the doing that's burning out. It's not doing too much, it's the, it's that weight inside. Using too much of a change approach that's comfortable within our armor when it's probably not best for the org. Say, so, well, Gloria, do you want to say more about that? Hey. Um, Hi. Hi, sorry. My, my... Oh, you weren't ready. Sorry, I caught you off guard. So, sorry, can, can you hear me? Yeah. We can hear you. You can hear me, sorry. Yep. We can hear you. So you say we're doing too much of a change when that's comfortable in our armor. Oh, maybe Gloria can't hear me. Gloria? Can you hear me now? <laughs> I, can, I can hear you, yeah. Uh, sorry, I, I, I couldn't hear. Um, it's, it's when you're always in your armor. I think armor is great where you're just using the same thing that you're comfortable with. And, and sometimes I think what ends up happening is because you're not self-aware and you're just in your comfort zone, it's probably, you're not making the impact that maybe you need for the organization. And then that kind of causes this bad feedback loop. So that's kind of what I was thinking. I love it. Thank you. So one of the keys that I, the key words that I, little red flags that I look for there is when I hear people saying um, they don't get it. Like, this is what we need to do, but they don't get it. The executives don't get it, The people, whoever doesn't get it. That is lacking self-awareness because them not getting it is kind of important for the transformational change. So rather than judging that they, they just don't get it and this is what we need to do, let's talk about why, what is it that they're not, what, what is it that they're resisting and why? Okay, I'm gonna jump us to the we, and please continue. I see there's lots of stuff in the chat here. Um, and continue to ask questions and chat along the way because we're going to go maybe probably right till the end here. We have some good stuff here. All right, so let's talk about the we. So we talked about the me, that's the inside. The we is how we connect with other people. And just two of the core competencies there, and there are many, um, but I think one of the most important ones is healing the pain. And we, like Gloria, you just talked about that. So 
healing the pain that the organization is in is key for connecting and transforming. And then the second one I put here is getting buy-in. Um, that's one of the most, probably the single most common question I get. So let's talk about that getting buy-in. All right, but first let's talk about healing the pain. We can't, and Gloria, your point was a good one. We can't impose some kind of a framework or change on an organization if there's still festering pain oozing out of the organization underneath. Sorry for the graphic metaphor. Um, we can't build on top of that. You have to heal that underneath that that underlying pain first. And sometimes I hear people say, "Well, um, well, that pain that they're feeling has nothing to do with my, my agile transformation or my digital transformation or whatever my transformation is." I don't care because you can't put your agile on top of a bleeding wound. So you have to address it, even if it's not within the scope of your of your mission. So. Um, you know, I tell a story about an organization I went to and there was just so much um, bad friction between marketing and finance that marketing kept cranking out products and finance couldn't bill for them. So the customers it never went out to the customer because we couldn't charge the customer for them. Um, and marketing was just kind of like, well, we're doing our job. We're cranking out products. But products weren't getting out the door. So until we hailed that relationship, and stopped cranking out products and shoving them down finance's throat who wouldn't release them out or be able to charge customers for them it, it didn't matter what we were doing so healing that pain and marketing is like hey that's not our job right but until you heal that pain we can't really transform the product flow right you can't get products out the door so that's just an example but everyone was very resistant to wanting to address that because it had been a problem for so many years the two organizations were always at odds and it was it seemed to be impossible and it really just takes a minute to acknowledge it to acknowledge that this is painful and important and that we need to maybe direct some energy towards it there's no magical formula here except for directing energy towards it i know it sounds a little reiki but it is really what it is is like let's like, let's just face it so where is there some pain in your organization that hasn't been attended to and you can put it in the chat or you can put it in your little organizer or somewhere journaling but there's always pain in organizations when i go in as a consultant you know i get all kinds of information and then eventually i get to well there's this pain that i'm not going to bother telling you because we can't do anything about it and that's the pain so i see karen saying there's always some degree of pain um from the culture and it's more and more huge to address right so i think i love that um there is always some um i think ignoring it right is much worse than at least acknowledging it so sometimes sometimes acknowledging it is the whole solution right you don't even need to do anything about it I, okay i love your comment gary about the uh basically the burning platform there has to be enough pain to force them to change um sometimes there's pain that's forcing the change and sometimes there's just other underlying baggage pain that has nothing to do with the so the pain might be where our you know our products are going off patent or something and that's the immediate pain but the underlying pain is you know we all you know these r d doesn't get along with marketing is like the underlying pain Okay, attrition, funding, non-technical leadership of technical teams. Yeah, I mean, attrition is one of those things or even layoffs where companies kind of brush under the carpet the soulful impact of layoffs and just say, well, that's what we had to do. And now we're moving forward and, you know, suck it up, buttercups. But that there's some, there's some painful impact that's left. And, you know, some people are left to do more with less and there's pain that they leave behind. Okay, so that's pain. So think about that. Think about where there's some unaddressed, ignored, not talked about, um, sacred cow that we can't talk about, pain in your organization. All right, so let's talk about getting buy-in because this is the biggest question I get from everybody. Um, how do I get buy-in? And the answer is don't ask for buy-in, but we can talk about that a little bit more. The problem with, and I, that's a little bit like Fight Club here, right? Like don't talk about Fight Club, don't talk about buy-in. It's not that you don't need buy-in. It's that I don't want you to ask for buy-in because as soon as you've asked for buy-in, you've given away your power. So let's review the facts. Someone hired you to do this work. 
presumably. Now, I get that the people you need buy-in from may be lateral or not the exact same person that hired you, but someone hired you. And fact, also, your work will help the organization, I hope. Um, so when you're asking for help or when you're asking for buy-in, you're giving away your power. So we don't want to give away our power, but that doesn't mean that we don't need people to be on our side, right? We want people on our side. We want people engaged. So how do we do that? So I want to talk, I want to talk a lot and maybe another time, Chris, about power. We could talk about power the whole time, but I want to just plant a few seeds with you about power while we're here. Um, so power axiom number one, I wrote this just for you, is being able to help. So offering your help is a super powerful way to get buy-in without asking for buy-in and subordinating yourself to the other person by saying, I need your buy-in, I need your support, please, please, for me, for my agenda. No, I can help you, right? I, so think about these two, these two sentences. The first one is, I need your buy-in to get people using prioritization practices. I need your buy-in, please, please help me. Versus number two, I'm, I know I'm swaying the witnesses here. Uh, number two is, I know you're having trouble managing capacity. I can help you by implementing prioritization practices. So which of these, oh, how do you react differently between those two? How do they sound? And I, know, I, know, I know did the whole voice and everything with it, so I swayed you a little bit. But how do those sound different? You can go ahead and throw in the chat. And then which one of those is more powerful for you? I need your buy-in or I know you're having trouble and I can help? right? Pleading versus partnering, right? And I did the pleading voice, so that was a little bit unfair. I get it. But um, yeah, right? So we, we don't want to be subordinating ourselves. We want to be partnering as an equal partner. I can help you. One shows empathy. And I th think that that's number two, hopefully. Definitely number two, adding value. The first one feels like the speaker is making it my problem. The second one is the speaker is fixing my problem. Right, exactly. I'm here to help you. Okay, so that's the first thing here. The second power axiom is, I can't see it, um, is the presumptive close. So those of you who have been in sales know the presumptive close. So here's your, my two choices. Would you agree to weekly coaching for all leaders? Like, can I get you to agree to have all your leaders be coached weekly? Versus number two, my team's going to be providing weekly coaching for all leaders. What do you think? <laughs> right, so I'm kind of assuming in that second one, well, I shouldn't give it away. Maybe you can put some stuff in the chat. What do you think? How did your reactions differ and which one's more powerful? One, and yeah, so one is asking for permission and the second one is telling. Now, I realize, say what is your reaction? Because I realize for coaches, we really want to be collaborative and we don't want to be directive. We've been taught as coaches. And when you're coaching, you wouldn't use number two. But, but this is not coaching. Transformational leadership is not coaching. So it's a bit directive number two. Now I'm asking for feedback, but after I point the direction. Um, as a coach, you'd say, would you agree? What do you think? You'd start with the collaborative stance, but in transformational leadership, maybe not so much, right? So number two makes it undeniable that we're doing the lift, right? Right. And that's a good point too, Eric. So number one, it's like, I'm putting it on you. You know, what do you, you know, would you agree to this? Maybe I need to do something. There's a reason they hired you and you should know what to do. Right. So that's the presumptive close. So that's just a few things about power there. We'll get back to power in a minute. So buy-in, how do we get buy-in? We get buy-in by caring. We get buy-in by caring and helping. That's how you get buy-in, not by asking for buy-in. Okay, so that's my that's my final thing on buy-in. And I, this has been very effective for me. Offering help has gotten me, always gotten me a seat at the table instead of demanding a seat at the table. Okay, so let's get back to burnout. So how does healing the pain and standing in your power um, prevent burnout or standing in your power and this getting buy-in? How does that prevent burnout? So first of all, pain is exhausting. Just like I said, armor was exhausting. Pain is exhausting. Working around that, trying to sort of avoid that and work around all of that festering pain is exhausting. But I think even more important, feeling powerless is frustrating. It's frustrating to feel like you're trying to lead a transformation that people 
don't want, that you can't get buy-in, that is a big source of burnout right there. So standing in your power will help you prevent burnout. So this is all about the we. So it's connection with other people. And where is that burning us out? And Dave is saying a great many people don't seem to want to help, don't seem to want help at work. And that's okay. Right. So that's where I talk about, um, you know, help uh, share shamelessly. So whether or not they want, they don't have to take it. I don't have to care if they want my help, but I can still offer it. Okay. Any, anything to add about where your connection with other people is burning you out? Hey, if you're an introvert, your connection with other people is burning you out <laughs> because that's, that's where we get exhausted. No one believes they're doing anything that's incorrect or could be improved. Well, that, um, then we play the ballpoint game, right? Don't coaches play the ballpoint game if people don't to show about continuous improvement. Yeah, so there, that is something to show, like how do we show and make visible the fact that more improvement is possible. Okay, well, let's jump here into the system and talk a little bit about, so we talk about the me, then the we, and then influencing the system. And a lot of us, I think, love the system because that's sort of an interesting and fun thing to tweak and play with. But we have to think about the system's complicated and there's people in it. So one of the other questions I'm asked a lot is, what about roadmap? What do I do for my transformation roadmap? So let's talk about that. And then we'll end with my favorite topic. We'll get back into power and politics. The, top, the two topics that nobody wants to say those words. Okay, so transformation roadmap. Um, the two things just to keep in mind there are hold that timing lightly because um, you know, we don't, you don't really know what a transformation roadmap is going to look like, but you can put something out there that you're willing to stand behind and say with a straight face. I'm always sort of betting on the fact that they'll be so happy with where we are that they won't really worry too much about what it was promised, right? Because the train, the change will be so, so wonderful and enlightening that the fact that it didn't map to the roadmap, it's not, well, that they'll forget that. So that's kind of what I've kind of bet on. Um, oh, we're recording this. Don't let my clients hear that. But that that has been my experience is that the change has been so much better than expected that the the timeline didn't so much matter anymore. But the sequence is the other piece. So how do we sequence a transformation roadmap? So yeah, Chris is going to edit this for me. Thanks. Um, the sequence is heal the pain if there is some festering pain. There usually is, not always, but usually. Um, and then look for that biggest opportunity. And I don't want to say low hanging fruit, but the biggest, most important opportunity to make that make change in the organization. And then you can go for the holy grail after that. And I'll talk about what I mean by that. But the when I say that about the sequence, it is, oh, maybe it's here. Yeah, it's right here. It's based on your, your organization's unique opportunities and challenges, what their pain is, what their biggest opportunity is, what their holy grail is, versus some outside framework that says, logically, you'd implement it in this order. And I've done this a lot where there's rework. Because I'm not, you're not, you're not um, rolling out your roadmap in the order that's building on the, the prior. So sometimes we might not have any strategy or any OKRs because they're not ready for that and they don't have time because they're way over capacity. So we have to fix that first and then circle back to strategy later. Now that's not ideal. No one would put that in a textbook. But in the reality, it's impossible to do some of these other things until we jump to step four because they need that the worst. The most, I guess. So that's just something to think about: is uh, what is what is our sequence, and does it fit? Does it? Are we trying to make it fit what some consultant like me told you? <laughs> I see Gary saying, "Favorite transformation question: When will it be done?" Right. So that goes to the hold the timing lightly. When people ask me when it will be done, I and we talk about what done looks like. I'm okay with saying it'll be done, and you can get rid of me, the consultant, after X amount of time, and then we'll we'll talk about it when we get there. I'm not worried. So I can, I can tell you it'll be done. It'll be done to some level all the time, right? but I can say it'll be done in a year or two years, whatever you want to hear, because it will be better then it would be better. And then you can decide if you want to make it even better, even more better when a scrum master is no longer needed. Right. 
Okay, so I made up these sample roadmaps for you. So don't take, please do not take them literally, but for, and it's sort of a composite of different clients I've worked with, but the opportunity is we need to innovate to keep up with some disruption, to avoid disruption in our market. The challenge is where we have no time to do that because we're all so busy. So again, this was what I was referring to. So first we have to understand and measure our capacity and then start Q2 working within our capacity. Because if I can't solve your capacity problem, we can't keep up with disruption. So first solve that healing, that pain of being everyone working over capacity. Then we can start to optimize and prioritize across business units and not until all of that is in place and that pain is healed and we've tackled that opportunity can we actually get to the holy grail which is investing in strategic innovation right so we've got our pain being healed in q1 and q2 q3 we've got some opportunity to prioritize across business units and q4 holy grail it wouldn't happen in probably four quarters but i made it on one slide for all of you but do you see what i mean there about healing the pain tackling an opportunity and then getting to the holy grail and this holy grail, who knows when you're getting there, but at least they can see on the roadmap that that opportunity that we're going for, we didn't forget that, we just can't get there yet. Okay. So that's a sample roadmap. And I put some, there's some more detail, like what things you might do in each of those items, right? You might make work visible stuff you would do, limit whip, um, start collaborating, doing portfolio. You might do your OKRs over here. Um, all of these things to get to the point where you can now be innovative. Another one was opportunity was increased sales by building entrenchment across product lines. But the challenge was that the teams were working in silos at cross purposes. So we can't break down those silos and get entrenchment across product lines until we first get aligned on strategy understand our customer's journey across product lines, and then start working in some, some teams that have some cross product strategy in them. Um, and then we can go and implement some team practices. We can't even implement team practices until we even have teams because we don't even have teams in the beginning here or we don't have cross-functional teams. And then at the end, we can finally reach the holy grail of connecting our product lines and getting customer entrenchment across product line. Okay, so those are some sample roadmaps for you. But again, don't take mine, make your own. All right, ready to talk about my favorite topic? I see Chris is ready. Um, my favorite topic is politics. So go ahead in the chat and I would love for you to fill in the blank here. Politics is blank. What is politics to you? The enemy of innovation, dealing with people. That's because Gary knows me. <laughs> Gary and I have probably talked about this. Uh, politics is people, dealing with people, the blocker, looking good without being good. My pain is showing. <laughs> is my pain showing? Yes, it's painful. The word politics creates an emotional reaction in a lot of people, which is why I love talking about it, because <laughs> I think we need to deal with it. Power, walls between orgs, painful, necessary. Okay, good. Well, let's take a look. The definition that I like to use, and some of you have alluded to it, is politics is navigating the human system. And we talked about living systems a little bit. Um, the organization is a living system, whether we want it to be a machine or not. It is a system made up of human beings. Um, people will tell me, I love my job as a transformation lead, except for the politics. The politics is the only thing I don't like. Well, if you want to lead a transformation, I'm here to just tell you the honest truth, truth teller, um, it's politics. The whole job is politics. So if you don't like politics, leading a transformation is probably not the job for you. I'm just gonna be honest because really that like being an influencer, all of that stuff, it's a political job. There are lots of jobs that are not political. Transformational leadership is political. But let's talk about what that means, because leading, navigating a human system, there's good politics and bad politics. You can navigate the human system in a good way or a bad way. It doesn't have to be bad. Okay, so it is the most common reason that transformational leaders fail, because they don't understand the politics and the power flow in the organization. So why do you think that is? Why do you think it's the most common reason for transformational leaders to fail? Dance with the brick wall every day. I'm looking in the chat. 
yeah they had collaboration not transparent why do you think that so many transformation leaders fail because of po power and politics any thoughts on that one okay i see your question here um who is it melanie uh how do you navigate mid-level blocking let's i'm gonna can make sure we address that one later because I want to get through the basics of politics and we can talk about how to navigate it. So many don't like change. Um, what examples can I provide? Okay, let's talk about some examples in a minute. Let's um, just talk about the, a lot of times the failing is because there is a misunderstanding of what how power is flowing and where and how to navigate the human system. That is why the, that is why there is a failure. Um, under, so I recently worked with a team, I'll give you an example, here you go, uh, that the transformation was struggling because other people have more important things to work on. And I was like, well, if they have more important things to work on, why are we trying to get, why are we trying to get them to do this? So they were trying to sneak transformation in around the edges. If it's not the most important thing. I like let's make it them like let's make it tie and help with the most important thing because if they have something more they had a merger if they have something more important that they're working on we shouldn't actually be disrupting them with something that's less important so let's help let's make the transformation part of the important thing like let's help with the important thing okay could be too too big of a scope yep uh shut down if not not introduced in a way of those except uh acceptable to those in power people block it, but let's talk about why people block it. Empire building, right? So let's talk about why why the empire building. Um, hard to see the true power play. Uh, no unified change leaders or joint communication to expi in, inspire change. Right, so that's, that is about the influencing and the politics is getting people on board with the change and understanding how it's beneficial. Okay. Um, I, I want to back up for a second. I mentioned this before, and I'm going to mention it again. It's not coaching. <laughs> That's one of the other reasons that that transformation leaders fail, because it it isn't necessarily coaching. Like you have to point in a direction and take a stand. And that coaching style as a transformational leader doesn't necessarily work and help. So you want to be collaborative, but th there's got to be some strength and power there in order to be successful. Okay, enough about that. So let's test your political style. So either grab a sheet of paper, if you have a really good memory, you can do it that way. But which statement both most, sorry, best reflects your actions regarding politics. So you initiate most of the politics that happen. You can read the tea leaves, but you don't always get involved. Or you don't get involved, you just respond to the result. So pick one, two or three there, which most best describes you. We're going to put you into a matrix in a minute. Okay. All right. Let's see. Now, which best reflects your view of workplace politics? Zero sum game, only one winner, necessary, necessary part of the workplace, or a fun and exciting way to get things done? Okay. Once you have your, I'll leave it up there for another second or two, and then we're going to see where you fit. And this is from the book Political Savvy, by the way, which is an old book, but very valuable in terms of understanding how this stuff works in a way that can be, you know, for good and not for evil. Okay, so here you have your ABC at the top and your one, two, three down the bottom. Now, if you think that it's a zero sum game and that, um, but you do initiate most of the politics, you're this Machiavellian manipulator, right? You're looking out for number one. This is the empire building. Um, that's not a great place to be. That's the, and I, it's interesting, like you might think about people that you see in that space. Um, some of them are really good at it and that's a bit dangerous. Sometimes I see people that are really bad at it and work in that space and they just, they're out of their element. So they're trying to be manipulative, but it's super obvious and everyone, and everyone gets that they're not really genuine. Um, that, but then if we go down to the bottom right corner here, the spectator, fan encourager, you know, if you're leading a transformation, you can't be a spectator. It's not a spectator sport. So we need to move up to this. And if you look at this cynic, of course, you're not, you're not initiating and you're not responding. So of course you, 
that, that's a really a, a recipe for failure. We want you to be somewhere closer to here where you are initiating the action, but looking for it in a very positive way, right? Not looking to manipulate, you know, it's not about ego. It's about using that to, to navigate the human system and to get everybody aligned in a good way, but also making moves. You're making your own moves. So let's see what's in the chat here. Uh, so Mary's a 2B, okay, speculator, grapeviner. So Mary, what would it take to move you into, uh, to up one and over one? That's the question. And you don't have to answer, you can answer though. 3C, okay, spectator. I know as coaches, we don't like to be the initiator of politics, right? But if we're moving into a transformational leadership role, we need to. Okay. Very good. So this is just a little bit of the layout. And this is why people think politics is bad. Because, you know, a lot of times it's over here about the zero sum game. Okay. Uh, as a transformational leader, Val, we want to be in one C. Leader, playmaker, impact player. So we want to be initiating, but with a positive view. And the risk over here of being of this negative view, and I've heard people, some industries are, are live in this live in this uh, 1A quadrant over here. I mean, it's the whole industry or it's the whole company. So it's hard to be positive when you really have to watch your back. Um, but the risk over there is that you can be taken down. You're gonna be taken down by your enemies. And in 1C, you don't, you, we try not to have enemies. All right. Um, so Karen's saying, how many of us are consultants? How many are employees? I don't know the answer to that but a consultant and need to identify with the best deal and best deal with the politics. I find that's interesting you say that, Karen. I feel like I, I can operate a little bit above the fray as a consultant, but that doesn't mean that I can be, I can't just be a spectator. All right, so let's keep going because I know we just have a few minutes left. So power axiom number three, leaders, leadership is not coaching, I gave that away. Leaders lead, and I, I love the, I love the Greenleaf book on um, servant leadership. It's one of my favorite little books ever, but he does make the distinction in the book. It's servant and it's leadership. So let's not forget the leadership. It's not just servant, it's leadership. So take a lead, have a strategy, take a stand, and then you can also be collaborative. Of course, we don't wanna be a dogmatic um, autocratic leader. And so you see the little penguin is, is leading the way. There is, a, there is something about pointing a direction. That's important. Frederick, I see your question on moving from the current to the 1C. Um, there's a lot here about that, about being able to, you know, using the roadmap, doing the influence, um, shaping the system, connecting to other humans. That whole section on the we is important for moving to 1C. All right, so how does a healthy system then prevent burnout? Well, a good roadmap keeps us grounded with an eye on the future. So not knowing where we're going, it kind of creates that ambiguity that can create burnout. But positive politics keeps you from that feeling of being shut down and shut out. So understanding that we're navigating a human system and not trying to manipulate each other is, is useful with um, preventing burnout. And then thinking about like, where is our system unhealthy and causing burnout? Because any kind of toxicity in the system or even if it's not even toxic, but it's just friction and the system can cause burnout. So I'm gonna to jump to the end here and then we'll talk about questions because I know there were some questions in the chat so we can go back to those. Um, but before we do that, I just wanna make sure that you all hear in case people have to drop, we are launching this transformational leadership community coming soon. So follow me please to stay in the know. And if you have things that you wanna learn in the transformational community, that you are transformational leadership community, please fill in our form here, which Kat maybe can put in the chat for us, because we'd love to hear about what the community is looking for so that we can create a community that gives you and helps, helps you along and helps nurture the nurture you along your journey. And then here's lots of places you ways you can keep in touch with me on LinkedIn. Um, my personal page and then also the cultivating transformation page where you'll get a lot of information about what we're doing with launching the community. 
Thanks, Kat, for putting that in the chat. And I know there were some questions. There's a lot of really deep questions here that we didn't have time to answer. And I know there were some that I said I'll go back to, but I don't know if we'll have time. What was the one I said I'd go back to? I think it was you, Danielle. Oh, here we go. It was Melanie. How do we navigate mid-level leadership blocking or convoluting communication between functional teams and upper 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 leadership? So that those are those places where I, you have to peel back that onion and find out why. Why are they blocking? One of the assumptions I always have is that people are doing are, are doing things with the best of intentions. So what are they afraid of? What are, they may, and I know that there's a lot of cynicism about they're afraid of losing their empire, but they might actually care. Those resistors are people who care because nobody's putting themselves out there to be a resistor and potentially lose their job if they don't care deeply about the company. So maybe they care and think that it's going to hurt the company or hurt their performance or hurt their team in some way. So finding out and pulling, peeling back the onion on why the blockage is informational for you and maybe will help build a bond with them. I find there's a ton of data from resistors. I love resistors sometimes. <laughs> All right. Let me see if there's any last minute questions and then Chris, I'll turn it back to you. Thanks, Jardina. I, do, I really appreciate being here today. This is super fun. Thank you. Yeah, this was awesome. Anybody have any last minute questions for Jardina? Go ahead and unmute yourself and shout it out if you'd like. So it's Karen as a consultant. Uh, where do you go in? How do you get the buy-in? And how long do you stay with an organization? Um, okay, a lot of questions there. Let's see. So where do I go in? I So I personally do a lot of my work at the executive level. So I go in at the executive level, which is super helpful, right? Because you're, I can um, engineer things from the top level. But it wasn't always that way. And I think that you can engineer them from any level. Um, so wait, so tell me your second and third question. Where do I go in? How do I what, say the second one? Um, um, you know, how long do you stay there? I mean, oh, transformation I for humans, it's lifelong. And right. again, you've got people with issues in organizations with uh, culture issues. And it just, so, you know, how long do yeah. you stay there? So I typically end up staying maybe like a year to 18 months, but I will tell you what I tell my clients, which is we'll do this, we can do this on a three month um, renewable contract because I think that you may not get all the value, but you'll get some value. And if you want more value, we'll do three, we'll do another quarter. If you want more value, you'll do another quarter. I don't feel like I need to have them commit to some kind of length of time because I think that incremental value is value is is useful and worth their money and time. And if they want more, they'll get more. Right. So, so I, I think that was another question. How do you get buy in? Um, mm -hmm. You know, it, it's a tough sledding, right? The first three months and you know, do you ever, you know, it's human nature to say, oh, I just don't want to deal with this anymore, you know? So how do you get them through the the hurdles? Well, so first of all, as I, I do have to say, as a consultant, it's a little bit of an advantage coming in from the outside, right? It's a little easier to work from the outside than, than the inside. So I maybe recommend just partnering with somebody from the outside to come and just say, we've done this before, it is possible. Um, it's hard to do that from the inside. I've tried it from the inside, so I know from both directions. Um, but again, the the in terms of the getting the buy-in, one of the things that a lot of consultants do, myself included, is we do some interviews. And that those interviews at first, those discovery interviews are key just to build that relationship and say, we feel your pain. We're here to help. And that, for me, is how I get buy-in. Really, that's that first step of buy-in, is, is understanding I understand where you're coming from. I feel your pain, not I have a framework and I'm going to impose it on you. Right. But I can partner with you. I bought it. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Great. Thank you. All right. I know I see some folks need to drop. We're at the top of the hour, but please feel free to reach out to me. I know there were lots of questions. I hope you'll join the community and we'll work through all of these kind of sticky problems that we face as transformational leaders.
Thank you so much, Jardina. This was absolutely wonderful. Very, very insightful as always. Uh, Joey and I are working on lining up someone for next month. I don't know if it'll be as good as Jardina, but hope to see you all soon again. And we will definitely invite Jardina back to talk more about power and politics. Oh, I love so thank it. You. Thank you so much. See you all soon. Bye, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Thanks. Bye.